Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mosia Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Fred Martino. We're so pleased that for the entire half hour today, we have New Mexico's second district representative, Social Torres Small. Thank you so much for being with us. Fred, thank you so much for having me. This is your first time on Newsmakers uh, after the election. You've been on many times uh, leading up to the election. Tell me uh, what this has been like, your start in, as a congressperson in such a chaotic time in Washington, D.C. Well, it's uh, certainly been a challenge. I've learned a lot, and I'm enjoying it. I'm so grateful for the chance to represent my home, and as I do encounter increasing partisan divides and uh, challenges managing, um, getting real things done in Congress, I'm so grateful to be grounded in the work that needs to be done and the examples of the hard work that communities and local governments and nonprofits are doing right here at home. It really drives me to continue to do the work in Congress. And of course, uh, you have had a situation that many folks have had throughout the Southwest who have been uh, elected previously to Congress or who were newly elected in that our entire region is really the national and international focus with immigration issues. This is something that uh, you have been working on and a lot of this is causing now a lot of stress for our local communities because they are putting up funding, local funding, for a federal responsibility uh, to provide shelter for asylum seekers. As you know, the city of Las Cruces has, has been uh, at the forefront of this, providing up to a half a million dollars and uh, providing shelter and hopes to get reimbursed by the federal government. Where do you see this going? I really appreciate you noting the incredible hard work and strain that this is putting on local communities and governments. Here in Las Cruces, for example, I've also met with uh, Hidalgo County commissioners and other, uh, other leadership that has noted the increased strain on resources because of the rapidly growing numbers of people and families who are voluntarily presenting along the border. Uh, it's also putting enormous strain on our federal Border Patrol agents uh, who are working hard and are being um, overwhelmed by the work that has to be done. Um, and, and, and we all have a role in this, but it's the federal government's job to, uh, to help solve these problems, both by getting resources there now, and that lies with the administration as well as Congress to make sure it's funding, and addressing the long-term root causes that we're seeing. Uh, so I'm working hard to make sure that we're getting resources in the right place uh, because this shouldn't be the responsibility of the local governments. Are you optimistic that there could be reimbursement down the line? I think there are opportunities for that, and one of the things I'm pushing for, Congress is currently working on an emergency, or on a supplemental for uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and that supplemental, I think, is incredibly important uh, that it includes support for local governments and nonprofits that are doing this work. Uh, so we're, I'm pushing for that now, while I'm also pushing to get more resources in terms of personnel in our most remote areas, uh, supporting centralized processing centers that also include, uh, allow volunteers to do some of the relocation efforts. Uh, there's a lot of work that can be done, but we need the federal support to do it. Okay, well speaking of federal support, you know that long before we had the issue with this recent influx of mainly Central American migrants. There has been a big backlog in the courts. And I'm wondering about the status of funding to provide an adequate review of asylum cases on the ground and then in the courts so that we don't have these long backlogs for people who are simply 
uh, exercising a, a right guaranteed uh, in the United States to seek asylum. So this is uh, a key issue in terms of root causes and impacts. We need to make sure that the asylum process is more efficient and predictable because right now we have families um, who are going through extreme hardship uh, fleeing poverty or uh, violence and some of them, if no matter how severe that poverty is, won't be if it's poverty alone, won't ultimately be uh, eligible for asylum. And that's why we have to have a clear process for asylum. I was glad that the bipartisan agreement to get the government back up and running included increased funds for immigration judges, and we need to make sure that those positions are filled. And we need to make sure that there's the right guidance for clarity in the process. I also think a fundamental part of the solution is making sure that there are opportunities for people to apply in country, in Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador, um, that they can apply in country so they don't have to face these extreme hardships uh, only to later find that they are not eligible. Okay. As you know, this is also a major financial stress for our region, for the entire nation, because we have uh, problems with folks sitting for hours and hours and hours waiting to bring uh, cargo across the, the border in both directions. This is, this is really a serious uh, matter. Um, what efforts are underway to get more agents so that we can expedite trade? Growing up on the border, I know how important trade is to our economy and how we have invested uh, to try to create opportunity, economic opportunity based on that trade. New Mexico is a net exporter and our uh, biggest trade partner is Mexico. So it's so important that we facilitate that trade. And so I've had hearings where I asked uh, CBP officials about about making sure that we're making this process more efficient. Uh, I've noted the long hours, including, uh, for example, produce, uh, the farm produce that's coming in that may actually end up spoiling before it gets to where it needs to go because of these long waits. Mm -hmm. Santa Teresa Port of Entry actually has a live video cam that shows how long or short the wait times are. Mm -hmm. So we've got to make it quicker. I uh, signed on to a letter that was bipartisan supporting uh, increased technology. There's a five million dollar back, or five billion dollar backlog of infrastructure needs at our ports of entry. And if we could get to work on that, it would help put a lot of people to work in our community uh, to support this robust trade economy. Uh, my first piece of legislation that I introduced was also to address this issue, asking CBP to put together a strategy on how to recruit and retain uh, customs officers as well as Border Patrol agents in our most remote areas. And that would also help address certain uh, ports of entry. Okay. So there's a lot of things that can be done. We can work on them together. It will also help our security because the majority of drugs that are coming in by land are coming in through legal ports of entry. And this increased technology would make us more secure as well. Okay. Well, uh, while this is not something uh, that is being talked about uh, nationally right now uh, in our region, we have not forgotten uh, the thousands of young people who were brought here as children uh, under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program initiated by President Obama. They had an opportunity to attend New Mexico State University, UTEP, our community colleges. They had an opportunity to go to work. Uh, and that's sort of been off the radar, but it isn't forgotten here. Uh, what it, what is being done in, in Congress? What do you see as the way forward to get permanent relief for DACA recipients? Throughout my time serving New Mexico's 2nd Congressional District, I've encountered young people who are entrepreneurs and uh, want to become doctors, who are um, soldiers, people who want to give back to the only home they know and that aren't able to uh, have a pathway to citizenship currently. And the overwhelming majority of Americans feel like these dreamers should have a, a home in the United States. And that's why I was proud to help lead introduction of um, the, the DREAM Act, uh, the Dream and Promise Act, to make, provide that pathway. 
Uh, we have to work to make sure it gets to the floor so that we can vote on it. And it should be a bipartisan issue. When almost 80% of the country believes that these individuals should be able to stay in the only home they know, if Congress can't get that done, we've got continued problems down the road. Yeah. Down the road, and this may be far down the road, uh, there, there's also a, a great need if you listen to uh, many elected officials and also many policy advocates for a comprehensive r approach. And that may not come in one bill, it may come in s separate bills over a long period of time. But where do you see this going and what if you were in charge, what would comprehensive immigration reform look like? Comprehensive immigration uh, is important because we've got uh, a, a comprehensive challenge right now in terms of how do we address the system that mm -hmm. isn't working. Our, our border policy is broken and we should be able to work together to address it. I was actually um, meeting with Secretary Perdue uh, last week and he was talking about the impact that immigration has on our agriculture and farmers and that reminded me of one of the first meetings I set up uh, for Senator Udall when I used to work for him which was with a farmer who was concerned about uh, his his job security he was also concerned about food security across the United States and about the people that he was able to employ because they couldn't get enough folks to help pick his crop so immigration, if, if done legally and right, is something that we can all um, rely on to help support our economy. And so that looks like a few things. We do need to have skills-based immigration to identify key places where there are real gaps, for example, in healthcare and in rural healthcare. Uh, we also need to make sure we're supporting our dreamers, that we're, getting, that we're allowing them to stay in the only home they know. Uh, I think work visas are a real clear example that could help address our asylum challenges where people are voluntarily presenting on the border fleeing extreme hardship but may not qualify for asylum. But meantime there are real work skills gaps that we have for example in our agriculture in industry that we could work together on. And, and I was really heartened by Secretary Perdue's comments that this should be something that we can work together on. Okay. Well, something that uh, it may be much harder to work together on, as you know, is reacting to the controversies uh, that continue uh, in the wake of the Mueller report that has come down. First off, I just want to get your general reaction to the report, your general reaction to the fact that uh, executive privilege has been uh, put forward not to present uh, the full report to, to only present a redacted version and not the evidence uh, behind it. What, what's your reaction to this? Well, and I can only provide a reaction to the redacted report that I've seen because I haven't read it in its entirety. No one has. It's Well, no one in the public has. It's right. not available. Right. Uh, in terms of what we've seen, I, I think it's important to acknowledge in as nonpartisan of a way as possible what's in there. So it did not establish or produce evidence to establish that there was any uh, conspiracy or collusion between the campaign and Russia. But it did acknowledge severe situations where Russia was involved in our elections. And this is something that should be bipartisan. It should be nonpartisan. The integrity of our elections matters. We should be able to work together to make sure that a foreign country isn't interfering with our elections in the future. As a member of the House Armed Services Committee, I think that that affects all of our national security, and we should make it a priority. Yeah. I think it also flagged some serious concerns in terms of leadership. I think we can all agree that if you're an employer, you shouldn't ask your employees to lie for you. Uh, I think we can all agree that no one should be hoping for uh, foreign intervention in our elections processes. And as we move forward, we should make sure that doesn't happen in the future. Yeah. So, uh, as, as you know, hundreds of uh, former federal prosecutors signed a letter uh, addressing this, and, and a quote from the letter is quite uh, alarming to many people. It says, uh, quote, the conduct of President Trump described in special counsel Robert Mueller's report would, in the case of any other person not covered by the Office of Legal Counsel policy against indicting a sitting president, result in multiple felony charges for obstruction of justice. Reading that, 
Um, does this, in a sense, in your mind, uh, say, hey, the, the, putting aside anything else, we need to see uh, this entire report. We need to see the evidence behind it. I think all of Congress should be able to see the entire report, and only once seeing that will I know what information is appropriate for, um, for, for release to the public. But I do think it's of deep concern that, that the uh, report is so heavily redacted and that there isn't as much transparency as there should be. At the same time, transparency and accountability is only part of Congress's job. We've got so much more to be working on, and, that's, and what I was elected for was to make sure that we had things like access to health care, as well as being able to afford it, making sure that we're investing in our infrastructure and our economy. So I want to focus on the things that we can work on uh, in addition to the transparency and accountability. One more quote that I want to present. This is actually directly from the Mueller report. Uh, I, I think is important in terms of context in order to have folks understand why some in Congress are also calling for uh, evidence to be presented that led to the report, uh, and this quote it really struck me, especially after something you've already referenced, uh, which is uh, the idea of who was told what in terms of uh, being able to tell the truth when, you, when you're being questioned. And in, in fact, uh, we're now even dealing with situations where folks are being told, don't, don't respond to a subpoena from, from Congress. So this quote says, from the Mueller report, substantial evidence indicates that in repeatedly urging former White House counsel Don McGahn to dispute that he, McGahn, was ordered to have the special counsel terminated, the president acted for the purpose of influencing McGahn's account in order to deflect or prevent scrutiny of the president's conduct toward the investigation, end quote. Well, what's your reaction when you read that uh, about folks who do say, hey, look, we got we to have the evidence? I think this underscores the fact that transparency and accountability is essential to our democracy, and that's part of Congress's job. Uh, the public deserves information uh, about these instances so that they can make the decision that they want to make uh, in upcoming elections. And that's part of Congress's job. But as I mentioned, that's not all of Congress's job. And right. I want to stay focused on the things that will have direct impacts on the people that I represent right now. Well, and Speaker Pelosi has talked about this, too. And she is, at this time, when we're taping this today, not yet ready for impeachment. Where are you on that? I do not support impeachment based on the information that we have right now. Right now. Okay. I, I think so now you're not we saying that continue. you're not ruling it out. You're we, just saying right now you don't have enough to say impeach. It, it is always part of our responsibility to ensure transparency and accountability. It's also uh, one of the beautiful things about democracy is that when you get information to people, they have the opportunity to decide in future elections. I think that's the right place for this information to go in the future. Okay. Uh, another related issue to this that goes far beyond Russia's interference with our election is just the very idea of uh, is everyone accountable to the law? In, in our country. And as you know, uh, one of the other controversies that has come up is that we in our country have a procedure and a rule that says if Congress, as part of its oversight responsibility, requests tax information from any citizen in the country, it should be turned over by the Treasury Department. The Trump administration is refusing to do that. Uh, what, what's your reaction to this? Again, for me, this isn't a President Trump issue. This is an issue about transparency and accountability and about voters having the information and access, th and access to that information that they need to make their best decisions. So I do think that tax returns should be made public. I think that's something that every president has done before this one, and, and it's, it's important information for voters to have. Uh, that being said, this is not our only responsibility. We've got to keep going on the work at hand as well. We've got to make sure that we're advancing on the priorities that the public has told us are, our, are the priorities when it comes to access to health care, when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to the economy. I'm not going to let the work, important work of transparency and accountability to detract from those 
other important issues. Let's move to one of the issues, and it's been uh, a highlight in uh, the start of the new Congress, and that is efforts to fight uh, climate change. One of your colleagues, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, has been at the forefront in this issue, calling for uh, a resolution for a Green New Deal. Uh, how should the federal government address uh, this issue? Because this is something urgent. And of course, New Mexico is addressing it. We're a leader at the state level. We, climate change is an issue that affects our future, that affects all of our futures. And that's why we have to work together to forge these solutions. It is urgent. It's, it's affecting our existing, uh, our existing uh, safety and security when it comes to fires and drought, as well as increased natural disasters, but it will also severely affect the future of our children and other generations. And, we have to work together. We can't afford not to. And that's why I was proud to co-sponsor and vote for the re-entry into the Paris Accords, which uh, makes sure that all countries are working together to address this global issue. Because the United States can't do it alone, but it also needs to be part of the solution. In addition, as important as bold, broad ideas are, they work only when they're followed up by specific solutions. And that's what I want to be focused on. I want to focus on working together to solve challenges with transmission so that New Mexico can continue to be a net energy exporter, also by investing in vocational training to support expansion of renewable jobs. We have to make sure that the areas that have borne the responsibility of producing the country's energy in the past have a real part in forging uh, cleaner solutions in the future. Okay, well, certainly uh, fighting climate change could come into our next issue, which is infrastructure. Uh, we, we need federal help to pay for infrastructure projects that deal with energy transmission, as you just mentioned, also uh, dealing with uh, providing clean, safe water, especially in the Southwest. Uh, President Trump actually uh, met with, uh, as you know, Speaker Pelosi and also with Senator Chuck Schumer, and they all agree that this is needed. How can, it ha how can we make it happen in Congress? I, I, it was exciting to see the discussions come and uh, to see agreement on the need. Uh, I think this is a place where we can work together. Uh, there, it's not without its challenges. We have to find a way to pay for this. It's an investment in our future, but we also can't uh, pass on the buck in terms of the cost to future generations. So we've got to be willing to have grown-up conversations about how we pay for it. Um, we've also got, and, and one of my concerns was after that meeting, uh, Senate Republicans uh, expressed expressed concern about the cost. And, and so we need to be willing to put to work together uh, to find ways to pay for this and um, to make sure that New Mexico and other rural places across the country have part have a part of this answer. So yeah. that we're getting, as you mentioned, energy transmission as well as um, good, reliable internet service because that's so fundamental to a growing economy out here. Speaking of our economy, we're quickly running out of time, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't get you uh, your comments on what's happening uh, in terms of trade. Right now, President Trump uh, has uh, apparently decided that, uh, you know, enforcing new tariffs is the way to uh, be able to advance our interests in terms of trade. A lot of others strongly disagree on this, and trade is one bright spot in New Mexico's economy. So it's very concerning, especially here, where, what is your reaction to this, uh, this approach, and where do you think this needs to go? Well, we've already talked about the importance of trade in our economy and in terms of the future of our economy as well. Uh, I have deep concerns that the tariffs, the reactionary tit for tat that we're seeing internationally is not helping our local economies. In fact, uh, I've met with a small business owner who uh, wanted desperately to continue her father's business but um, was facing real financial hardship because the metal that she needed as supplies was increasingly expensive, and meanwhile she was having trouble selling her final product because of tariffs on the other end. 
So she was getting hit both ways. And, and that's part of the reason why I signed on to a letter um, asking to stop these detrimental tariffs. Okay, so this is very, very much in development, I should say, we're ta as we're taping this now. New developments could even occur when this airs, but uh, you, you've made your point clear on this. You know, another one where uh, I, I doubt if new developments are going to come up uh, immediately, but it's certainly a big issue for the country and in particular for New Mexico, and that is college costs. As you know, uh, debt uh, from, from paying for college is second only now to mortgage debt in our country. Uh, many people uh, are saying that if this isn't addressed soon, uh, we're going to essentially have fewer people who are trained for the jobs of the future here and all around uh, the country. Uh, as you know, Senator Elizabeth Warren uh, and others are promoting sweeping new programs to pay for college. Uh, others have a, a different approach. Uh, there, there are even ideas in terms of colleges, and this is happening at Purdue University, uh, setting up financial plans where folks uh, have a portion of their income uh, taken over a period of years. So it isn't a, a loan with interest per se, but it is an agreement where you provide uh, income sharing. What, what ought to be done on this? New Mexico's future depends on uh, bright, new, uh, exciting, careers and opportunities here in southern New Mexico and making sure that people choose to stay here. I am still paying off college debt myself. Uh, I have friends who ended up not coming back to New Mexico because they couldn't find a job that would help them pay back the large student loan that they'd taken out. Mm -hmm. So we have to address this, and I think there are multiple ways to do that. I uh, supported legislation that would allow employers to uh, receive credit in their taxes if they provided uh, college debt repayment opportunities for their employer employees. I um, think that we should make Pell Grants accessible to high quality short term vocational training because we need a variety of skills to make New Mexico's future bright. As a lawyer, I know if the whole country was just made up of lawyers, we'd have trouble turning on a light, we wouldn't be able to flush <laughs> the toilet, we wouldn't be able to do all of these, to drive on a road, right? Um, because we need all of these skills to make things happen. Um, I also think that we should be in making sure that, that especially private industry is transparent in terms of job placement so that people don't end up spending a lot on degrees that don't actually get them anywhere uh, at the outside. Uh, we should also make sure that um, you can, these, these programs that are set up to make college or other training more affordable for loan repayment assistance, that those programs actually work, that those promises are being honored. Okay, very important information. Believe it or not, we've run out of time and uh, we thank you very much for sharing your opinion on all of these issues and uh, hope to have you back again in the near future. Fred, thank you so much. It's an honor to get to do this work. Thank you for being with us. Thank you at home as well for joining us. We hope you'll join us this week on KRWG Radio. Every weekday, it's morning edition, 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by here and now, noon to 2, and all things considered, 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org. We'd love to hear from you. Email us with your story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.